and Pathfinder. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce my friend and mentor, Lloyd Auerbach. He is the director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations, a consulting editor for Fate Magazine, president of the California Society for Psychical Study, and a professor at JFK University. He's the author of two audio tapes and four books. He's a professional mentalist and psychic entertainer, performing as Professor Paranormal. <laughs> He's chairman of the Bay Area Magicians Group, Club 53, and he was just elected president of the international organization, the Psychic Entertainers Association. Lloyd Auerbach has appeared on hundreds of radio shows and dozens of local and national TV shows, including Larry King Live, Unsolved Mysteries, The Today Show, Oprah, Sightings, and Late Night with David Letterman. And he is constantly haunting various reruns on the Discovery Channel and A&E. He holds a degree in cultural anthropology and a graduate degree in parapsychology and has been investigating the paranormal for close to 20 years. Let's have a hand for Lloyd Howard. Thanks, Jim. And uh, I do highly recommend, if you have not been on the San Francisco ghost hunt, you talk to Jim about it. It's a great tour of uh, Pacific Heights um, and just a wonderful bit of storytelling and a little bit of illusion, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. You know, when we talk about paranormal or psychic experience, there's a lot of things that conjure up in people's minds. And a lot of things, of course, the skeptics will jump all over. The word experience is very important. In fact, Vernon Nepi, who is a neuropsychiatrist up at the University of Washington and did a number of years worth of study around parapsychology, still works in it, but doesn't like to admit it to his colleagues because of their perceptions of parapsychology. Vernon coined the phrase subjective paranormal experience because the fact is that when we have a psychic experience, it's happening up here. It may be real. It may have an outside cause to it. Just like when we see something, there's something we're seeing. But it is a subjective experience. And in fact, everything we know is based on subjective experience. Yes, we measure things with equipment, but we have subjective observation of that equipment. So all of what we're dealing with is really subjective in, the, in many senses. When people talk in the New Age movement about creating your own reality, we all have our own realities. We all see things slightly differently, and that's dependent on a lot of different factors, everything from culture to our educational system. In fact, some people have talked about education as the greatest brainwashing system that, that humanity has ever come up with, because we teach people to perceive and to understand things in a particular way. And depending on where you are in the country, where you are in the world, you perceive things differently. Now, I want to kind of make a, a separation here. And one of the reasons uh, that I want to do this is because of the terminology of parapsychology, extrasensory perception. I want to make a distinction between sensation or sensory input and perception, because th those are two slightly different things, although they're clearly related. Perception happens in here. Sensory input is the data that goes into our senses. Now, we have how many senses? OK. Keep going. 30 is closer, depending on how you define it, actually. 30 is closer. We have the five typical senses we think of. Sight, smell, which is actually multiple senses of smell. Taste, multiple senses of taste. Touch, multiple senses of touch. We don't just have one sense of touch. And of course, hearing. Now, there's also a sixth sense, of, even just if you include those, those five as the five sensory groups. There's a sixth sense, not even counting psychic sense, if you want to call it that. And the sixth sense is our sense of balance. We have a physical structure in the inner ear, both sides of our head, that helps us determine our place or sensation of our, sp our spatial position. That is a sense in the clearest definition of the word. Data goes in, we know where we're staying, and if you get screwed up with that, you have a little bit of a problem with your balance. So a sense of balance is there as well. And then there's a seventh sense, which is some that one that actually not everybody has. It's the sense of humor. Unfortunately, <laughs> not everybody does have it. And that's a whole different thing because that is a learned, perhaps genetic, but mostly learned perceptual sense as well. When we have data coming in to our heads, when we see things, what's going on, of course, is information's going in, and we are limited to the visible spectrum. And not everybody sees the exact same visible spectrum that everybody else does. There are people who have been able to see slightly into the infrared or slightly into the ultraviolet, just like there are some people who can hear higher pitch and lower pitch as well. Um, and people have different, I guess you could say, thresholds of how they can hear and what affects them. In fact, how many of you are affected by the scratching of nails on a blackboard? 
How many are not, besides me? A couple people, yeah. So it just really depends on your sensations that are going in. That's a physical thing. Sound actually has more impact on our bodies than almost any of our other senses. If you think about the data going into our eyes and kind of computing in our brains, it's kind of like what happens with the space probes when they go into the far distant planets. The probes gather data and they send it back in a binary data stream. It doesn't get sent back as radio or TV signals, it gets sent back as digital signals. A computer receives that digital signal, recompiles it and creates a picture, which is exactly what's going on in our heads. Now how you program the computer to understand that data is the kind of picture you get. So depending on how it's perceiving or processing that signal, you're going to get slightly different pictures from the different parts of the, of the, the known solar system at this point. And that's what's going on in our heads. We have different programming for all of us. We have a little different wetware, of course. Our brains are slightly different. We also have different software going on in there. And that's based on how we learn to perceive as we're growing up. Now, when I was a, an anthropology student, one of the things that kind of stuck in my mind was a story about Colin Turnbull, who wrote a book about the forest people, the pygmies, in Africa, many, many years ago. And one of the stories that he told uh, to other anthropologists was taking some of the, the little people, as he sometimes called them, to the edge of the rainforest. Now these are people who grew up in an environment. Think about this environment. You couldn't see more than three or four feet in front of your face because there was something there. It's a, a very dense rainforest. They go to the edge of the forest. There's a veldt, a plains out there. And there's a herd of water buffalo off in the distance. But you know, they don't know distance. They can't see distance. They don't really think about distance. So to them, there are little bugs in the background out there. Now, the problem was the herd of water buffaloes coming closer and closer and closer, and they were freaking out because these bugs are growing. <laughs> Distance was different to them. Perception is different to them. And the way we learn to perceive affects our information processing. Different cultures have different perspectives. People on the East Coast from the New York area have no problem with somebody standing this close to their faces. People in California have a problem with that. I've noticed that when I, ever since I've been out here for the last 20 years. <laughs> so I try not to do it anymore. People in different parts of the country speak faster and hear slower, depending on who you talk to. So it really depends on our perceptions, the way we've learned to perceive, to understand communication, to understand things around us. And of course, we know that some people are colorblind, so they can't see exactly what they, say, what they think they're seeing or told that they're seeing. And of course, some people see fuzzy things. They don't have corrective lenses on. When someone is blind all their lives, if they've never seen at all, and they, through an operation or an accident, gain their sight, they have to learn to see. They don't know that this is white. They might know when they touch it that it's paper, but they don't know what color that is unless somebody points it out and says white and gives them definitions of terms. They don't perhaps associate sounds with things that they see until they have an association for it. They have to learn to program their senses, their perceptions of what's going on. Now, we got this other problem. In parapsychology, we talk about other perceptions. We talk about other information coming in, not through the normal senses. But we've all learned over the years, because this is the way we're taught, to look at and to deal with and to notice things from our normal senses. So if there's an extra bit of information that comes in, we might think it's our imagination. We also know that we can visualize things, and we can also certainly get that song stuck in our heads long enough. So if there's auditory information that's in our heads, or visual information that's in our heads that's not necessarily coming through our eyes and ears, who knows where that's coming from? We can identify things coming through our eyes most of the time, except when we have a hallucination. Now, hallucination is not necessarily something that is not real or doesn't have an outside cause. It is just simply something that is added to our visual field. In other words, it's a perception of something whose origin tends to be inside our brains. We imagine something, we're taking a hallucinogenic drug and that's affecting the chemistry of our brain, so we're seeing something. But it's not really there, but it's still very real and very visual to the person who's having that experience, who's seeing what they're seeing. They are seeing it. Is it there? No. So when someone claims to see something that is not physically there, like if any of you have cats, they often see things that we certainly can't see. Um, some people will make a judgment call and say the cat must be seeing a ghost. Other people might know that the cats have a little bit better vision in some respects or seeing something moving in the atmosphere such as a little bug or something else going on. They have slightly different visual acuity than we do. So you can make a perceptual belief system judgment call on the behavior of someone else. How we learn to perceive is 
based on our educational system and our belief system as well. Now, I'm going to do a little magic here as we go through because I want to illustrate some things also. In fact, magicians make use of several principles. One of them is perceptual expectancy, and the other is learned perception. I mean, the basis of magic very often is understanding how people perceive in our society. Uh, you might hear, if you ever, any of you know any amateur magicians or professional magicians, you'll find that there are some people who are kids magicians and most magicians who don't do kids magic. And it's because there's a particular way that you have to do magic for kids and you have to understand their perceptions because they haven't learned not to perceive things. They haven't grown out of the perception. If I tell kids to look over there, really young kids actually will. Adults will not. Um, years ago, I did, actually did a magic show for a friend's four-year-old at a birthday party. And for 15 minutes, we thought this was so funny. I told the kids to look over there, and I did a little, little switch-around trick. The kids all turned around, and they kept looking over there. I had to tell them to look back. The parents were laughing hysterically. So this went on for 15 minutes. So the kids kept looking over there, and I could have walked an elephant in. They would have been surprised. In fact, they were surprised at anything that happened. I just kept on picking things up on the floor and said, oh, look. They were amazed. They grew out of it. We all grow out of that stage, of course. Kids know where to look and where not to look if someone's doing something with sleight of hand. Kids are better observers. Unfortunately, they're better observers, and at the same time, they're told by their, their adults around them, no, that didn't happen, or no, you're just imagining it. And this is where we get into the problem in our society of being educated out of the perceptions that we call psi. Now, ESP, the, the phrase ESP, extrasensory perception, coined by J.B. Ryan so many years ago, is actually not extra, and it's not sensory. It is perception. Now, when we look at it in parapsychology, we are talking about something that is part of us and part of everybody, for that matter. Keith Harari, a number of years ago, changed that to extended sensory perception. He used sensory still very often. He usually calls it extended perception, but he even said you can leave in sensory because there's probably something going on that's sensory. There's something that is sensing things some structure in ourselves, even if it's just simply the energy system that we are that's sensing things. It's still sensing, it gets processed, it's perception at that point. But people can play with perceptions and we have to look at the belief systems of everyone because people make misperceptions, missed judgment calls, and there are certain things, of course, that relay, rely on illusion, in fact. Let's see if I've got... A little optical illusion. A friend of mine brought these back from Japan for me. These are great cards. Isn't that cool? It's just playing cards from Japan, you know? Um, it just has to do with the way the dots are presented and playing with our visual field. So that's an illusion. And think about it. I mean, you can really create things. And of course, we do see advertisements like this that are seen on one side and not seen on the other. We, we talk about one-way glass very often. It's reflected from one side and not from the other. So there are ways to play around with optics quite a bit. And how people see things and perceive things can be, uh, you know, a little different. It also is not just what people see, it's the entire environment that's going on. People are more apt to have a, an experience of amazement if people around them are amazed. If you've ever watched magicians on television versus seeing somebody in person, there's a big difference. Just like watching a stand-up comic on television, and watching a stand-up comic in person. There's a difference, because somehow there's an audience reaction that we all pick up on. We're more likely to be amazed if everyone else is going, ooh, wow, that's cool. Which is uh, strange for mentalists, people who do mental magic, because a lot of times the reaction is, okay. Three pieces of rope. Some of you have seen me do this. This is a good illustration of an illusion. They're all exactly the same thickness. They're all cut from the same piece of rope, long hank of rope. They're all exactly the same color. They're all a little dirty right now. And of course, they're all the same length. It's an illusion. <coughs> Trust me. Now, I know that you're actually seeing the illusion that is not there. The reality is, these are the same length. You're all seeing three unequal lengths of rope. I'm just kidding you here. This is a long, a medium, and a short sized piece of rope as you're seeing it. Is that right? Well, they all look the same to me. OK, forget about it. Um, we're in the ends up to the top. We'll get rid of the illusion, two and three. All right, we have two ropes, three ends each. How many ends does that make? Six. Right, two ropes, three ends each. Think about that. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. 
That's part of perceptual expectancy. When I say two and three, you say six. That makes sense until you think back on two ropes. No, 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 no. One, two, three. Now, this is an illusion. I'm not really doing this. I've got you all in a hypnotic trance. I'm just sitting here just letting it all play out for everybody. Uh, in reality, these ropes really are not the same length. We, had, we have a short rope, a medium-sized rope, and a long piece of rope. But the illusion is that they're all the same length. And it has to do with a principle. I, I'm, I, I'm sorry to say I'm not going to reveal any secrets tonight. Um, otherwise, I would have worn my mask. But uh, I don't want a price set out of my head. But the fact is that there's a principle in magic, and many principles in magic, that make use of optics and perception and expectancy. That verbal statement I made was a good illustration that people expect to see certain things, behave certain ways, and so they do. If you saw something not behave normally, you might think twice about it and maybe even ignore it. This is the problem with psychic experience. When things happen out of the ordinary, we are trained so well to think about things in an ordinary way and that things behave according to the laws of physics that in reality, we may ignore things, may not notice things. And a good part of understanding how psychic experience works really is to notice what's going on. Now, as I'm going through tonight with some of these things, if anybody notices what I'm doing, please do not spoil everyone else's fun and shout it out. Okay? That makes you like that 10-year-old boy who I don't no longer perform for. What is the camera noticing? Excuse me? What is the camera noticing? What is it? The camera is noticing the same view that you all are. And if you watched over and over again a replay, you might notice something unusual. But you'd have to know where to look. You'd have to get past your perceptual expectancy. You'd have to get past the learned, your learning of how things behave, including how people behave. And one other thing, I'll tell you one secret of magic, because most people don't know this. The reason why most people can't figure out a lot of magic tricks is because they're based on principles that have no application whatsoever in the rest of our lives. You have no frame of reference. Without a frame of reference, it's much harder to reverse engineer it. It's like getting alien technology, but not knowing how to pull it together. So you have to consider that there's a reason why. It shouldn't be frustrating to you. It should be a bit of technology that's amazing to you, because that's what's really going on. I'm trying to kind of minimize this, this situation here. OK. When we talk about psychic experience, we're talking about certain things that we know to be psychic. Or, I should say, things that we are told are psychic. We have to define these things. If I say I'm picking up something from somebody's mind, that's telepathy. If I'm picking up an image or information from a distance, we have labeled that as clairvoyance or remote viewing or remote perception. We've given labels for things so we can communicate with one another. Communication is essential. Uh, and so there's all this technical jargon, which often has different meanings. I mean, uh, I've been teaching at JFK for a long time at this point, since uh, 83. And one of the things I've done with some of my classes in the past is ask them for definitions of words like consciousness. Write them down. Write the, word, write the definition of spiritual. Now, if any of you, a couple of people are from JFK, but if any of you know students at JFK and some of the programs, you have 20 students, they write down 20 different definitions of the word spiritual. And if they read them out loud, fights are about to break out. <laughs> because people have been going along thinking that their uses of the language has been exactly the same as everybody else's. But because of their cultural or familial backgrounds, it's not because of their experience. If that's not perception, I don't know what is. We learn not only how the world works, but also the meaning of terms and ideas. That's why people get in trouble when they go to different parts of the world. You know, people f who come to California and don't understand our politically correct society, which is getting out of hand, um, have a problem if they come from parts of the world like New Jersey. <laughs> um, and I use New Jersey because I got a lot of friends in New Jersey. And the fact is that if they, they come out here and they act like people from New Jersey and New York, they're going to insult a lot of people. And they didn't mean to at all. And then people from California go to New York, and people in New York wonder, what's wrong with those people? And it's perception. It's how we learn how things work. All right, let's talk about psychic stuff here for a second. Our perceptions of the world are so loud. In other words, they're so big. When we see things, we're trained to focus on our sense of sight. 
We're fo trained to focus on our sense of hearing and all our other senses as we grow up. Those are survival oriented. We have to do these things. We have to learn about our sense of touch. We have to know when things are rough, sharp, hot, cold, painful. Um, I missed the hot thing this week. So you have to really pay attention to these things because we have to survive. And of course, people who don't may not survive. There, um, there are people who don't have a sense of pain. They don't feel pain. They might not feel there's one part of their sense of touch might be off. That's very dangerous, extremely dangerous, and definitely not a survival orientation for people. People who are blind have learned to deal with it. People who ha are, are deaf have learned to deal with it. People who don't have their taste buds or can't taste things really hate it, but they have learned to deal with it. You know, there are all sorts of issues around senses where people have learned. There are people who, who see things upside down because for whatever reason the optics of their eyes does not reverse the image properly. Their brain, the perceptual, the optic nerve, you should all, I don't know if you all know about this, but the fact is that our, the lens in our eyes actually reverses all images. Our, the back of our eyes is seeing everything upside down. When it goes into the optic nerve and is processed by the brain, the brain reverses it. But there is a deficiency for some people. It's, not, it's pretty rare, but there are some people who ha see everything upside down. So for ages, those people had until probably about 20 years ago when they, somebody came up with prism glasses, literally prisms, which, are, which look pretty dorky, I guess, because <laughs> they're big triangular pieces of, of glass, but they reverse the image as it goes into the eye so that they can see things properly. Otherwise, think about trying to get around the world. Now, if you learn to deal with things that way, fine. But it's hard to express yourself to other people at some level because there's not a frame of reference to deal with. So when we have a psychic experience, we have two problems. One, how do we explain it to ourselves? And two, how do we explain it to other people? And can we explain it to other people? And when we talk about emotions, we talk about trying to express those to other people. And we all know that that's a major communication issue in, in couples, <laughs> with couples because the ability to express emotion without, especially without using words that just simply are nice simple words like love, anger, hate, things like that. We have to be more expressive than that because there are degrees that we're dealing with. That's a hard thing to do. And that's all subjective. It's all in here and up here. Uh, all the research that's going on uh, around the parts of the brain that have to do with emotion lately have been working with actors who can evoke those emotions. Because psychologists trying to do research with emotions, it's very difficult to get any of us, the normal folks, into the laboratory. Okay, sit down. All right, now, I'd like you to feel, Lloyd, uh, be angry. I'm not angry. <laughs> you want me to make you angry? You know, they'd have to make me angry. So you have to kind of evoke that. And that's difficult. So when we talk about evoking certain experiences, it's very difficult unless they come from memory. We have to associate, which is what a lot of actors, actually, method actors will do that sort of thing. And that seems to trigger the appropriate parts of the brain, so we are learning about what parts of the brain are active. In fact, there's some recent research that indicates that humor may be relegated to a certain part of the brain as well, and there may actually be a sense of humor <laughs> in here. How it comes out, of course, is perceptual, and that we learn it, but you know, somehow I, I find that a little strange and funny. But, um, no pun intended, but, but sooner or later, they're going to try to pin everything on a, on a gene. There'll be a gene, a gene for humor somewhere along the line. The yeah, well, it'll be very strange, um, especially if they do gene therapy to make people more humorous. Yeah. People laugh about different things. People laugh about because of perception, because of the way we learn. If I get a signal, one of the problems in parapsychology is definition. If I get a signal of an image that might be in somebody's head here or maybe not, and I tell you all that, if that was a real thing that somebody had, maybe it's a photograph that somebody's carrying in their wallet or purse, the issue of where that image came from, is it from somebody's mind or is it from the photograph, is difficult to separate. In fact, it's really difficult to do a pure telepathy experiment for that reason, because you have to go on faith. So you say to somebody, you think of something, I'll try to get it, I'll say what it is, and you say, yes. Unfortunately, scientists have a hard time accepting that as evidence. Because, of course, we're all going to say, yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, with clairvoyance, there is a target that supposedly either no one knows or someone is looking at. If they're looking at it, it could be telepathy, it might not be, it might be clairvoyance. You could be getting it from the person's mind, you could be getting it from the item, item itself. It's hard to know. And it's, there's really no way to separate those two things out at this point because we can't backtrack where their perception comes from. You know, if I, if I walk 
blindfolded into a room that I've been in before and start telling people what's in that room and I really am blindfolded. It could be my memory that's describing things. If things have moved around, I'm in trouble. But it's purely, it could be my memory or it could be something psychic. In fact, when a psychic tells you something that sounds fairly general and could fit other people, it could be a guess, fishing, or it could be psychic. You know, if I guess that someone likes green because I'm seeing them wearing the color green, well, maybe that's, Jill, maybe that's your only green thing. And that, that's wrong when it comes right down to it. That's an incorrect observation. So you have to kind of take a little bit of, of a leap here with psychic perceptions. It's all subjective, however, except for psychokinesis. And then we'll get to that in a little bit. If I were to see a ghost in this room and nobody else saw it, doesn't mean it's not there. Could mean I'm crazy. Could mean that I'm just imagining things. It could mean that I thought that the sounds coming out of that coffee pot were an indication that there was a spirit here because of my belief system. Because maybe I've never heard this coffee pot do this sound before, so it must be a spirit that's actually activating that. It could also be that it, I thought it was an alien coming in for a landing. <laughs> you know, it's all our belief systems and how our perceptions actually work. And it's very difficult to consider these things. Uh, there are ways that things actually behave and ways that things don't behave. Let's see something real simple with perception here. Okay. You, sir. Think of any card in the deck of cards. Okay? I have a pr prediction right here. That's precognition. I never miss this one because the future is mine in the palm of my hand. I create the future. Think of the card. You got it? Yeah. What's your card? The three of clubs. Yep. Okay. Now, <laughs> what? Oh, you want to see it? Yeah, there's the three of clubs right there. <laughs> Well, I mean, you can plan for every contingency if you want to or not. It's all perception. It's how things are presented. That's what he saw, the actual three of clubs. He said a little tiny three of clubs. That's right. He missed the rest of the cards completely. He just missed the rest of the cards completely. Yeah, that's okay. But see, I didn't ask him that question. I didn't ask him to think of five different cards. I asked him to think of one in that instance. All right. When we're dealing with, um, with perception, Pick a card, any card. Take it. Look at it. Nine of spades. <laughs> oh, tricky guy. <laughs> Look at it. Nine of spades. <laughs> Anybody else want to try? <laughs> oh. Nine of spades. <laughs> now, there actually are more, there is more than one way to do that. Um, it depends on your force of will. And it depends on a lot of other things. Of course, there's a real simple explanation for that, too, which probably many of you are thinking at this point. Anybody? This time, somebody can say it if they want to. OK. Now, this is not something that I would do normally for an audience like you. I would use this deck in a completely different way. And in fact, this kind of deck works better on magicians than it does on the average person, the average audience, because this is the kind of thing that most people would think of that magicians would never think of. Because why would a magician ever do that to another magician? <laughs> And so we do that all the time. <laughs> but the perception is, uh, and there are ways to avoid having that conclusion reached as well. Um, I didn't do them. Excuse me? What conclusion is that? That they're all the same. It was obvious, wasn't it? <laughs> Perhaps, but not necessarily. If I had shown you the cards first and they looked all different, Or if I had shown you the cards and five minutes later had somebody pick one, would you have remembered that I showed you all the cards? Probably. 
but I could have done something tricky in between with those cards. Perception and memory are tied together also. And when we try to recreate any event, this is one of the, one of the statements the skeptics often make. The skeptics will say, uh, it's hard to recreate out of memory what somebody actually saw. They say that they saw a ghost. Well, we don't have all the factors involved, you know, what was really going on at that location. And that's true. It's very true. But what we do know is that when people have a psychic experience of any kind, because if it's loud enough or bright enough or intense enough to, for people to actually notice it without thinking about it, there's something more happening there. On the other hand, people will be led down the garden path very easily. Uh, every ghost case that I go on that has some paranormal component to it, I find that a good portion of every little thing that they're explaining to us or, or talking about, we try to get a little checklist of everything they've said is happening. So much of it is stuff that's very easily explainable. And it's, there are things that they never noticed before about their house. No, noises that their house made, noises the coffee pot made, but because now they had an experience that put them on edge, it's an abnormal or unusual experience or a paranormal experience. Now they're sensitized to notice things in the environment that most of us never notice on a daily basis. This is part of the process of learning to perceive. We have things happen to us on a daily basis that we completely ignore. How many of you know people who, can, who hear what they want to hear? Okay, usually, my, like my brother, it's usually a sibling, typically, or it could be yourself, for that matter. Uh, or there are people who see what they want to see, who notice what they want to notice, and it's partly the way that they are, it's partly the way that they deal with the world, it's partly the way that they believe things are going on, and people will tend to ignore things that are out of the ordinary, even if for the rest of them they're very ordinary. I'm not even talking about psychic things. People being set up with unusual phenomena um, I know that uh, Jalen Hynek, who was the head of the astronomy department when I was at Northwestern University years ago, was the leading expert on UFOs at the time. And Hynek always talked about occasionally faking people out. Um, he, he pulled a few things on some of his skeptic buddies where he had some things happen, either unusual noises or even evidence that was clearly obvious to everybody. It was faked. But the context was for the skeptics not to notice things because they didn't want to notice these things. They were unusual. They shouldn't happen. And lo and behold, for, not for all of them, but for some of them, they pretty much ignored things right in front of their faces, which had they looked at them, they would have realized they were phony, but they didn't even notice them because there was this UFO context. It was out of the ordinary. It was their blind spot. So things happen in this way for a lot of people. In parapsychology, we're talking about expecting the unexpected, perceiving the unexpected. And in fact, one of the things that uh, a, a psychic by the name of Alex Tanis years ago, who I worked with at the American Society for Psychical Research, Alex was an unusual psychic who, uh, he had every ability. I mean, he could do just about everything. He, everything from healing to diagnostics from, pre he predicted actually on the air, on radio, he predicted the death of John Lennon a week before his death. Um, strangely enough, and the way he did it, I should say, it wasn't as clear cut as that. But he was asked, he was interviewed at the American Society for Psychical Research a week before John Lennon's death. Uh, Lee Spiegel, the host of the show, asked him to make a prediction, and Alex got quiet and said, a major rock star, a musical, music star, a pop star, is going to die within the next week. He's going to be murdered. Lee said, can you tell us who? And he says, you know, I'm getting four or five different names. He starts out number one, John Lennon, moves down the list. Now, Alex realized after the show um, that it probably was John Lennon because, and he should have gotten this right away, and so should Lee, the Dakota was right across the street from the ASPR. That's where Lennon lived. In fact, when I worked there, I used to see Yoko and Paul Simon and a bunch of other folks wandering around. Alex actually tried to contact John Lennon. Uh, couldn't get through, which is no surprise. But he did find out, and actually we found out it was verified by the police, that Lennon let his bodyguards go the day before. So whether he was fatalistic or something else was going on, who knows? Uh, Alex was one of those people who actually could perceive things, but he also felt you could change it. The reason he wanted to warn Lennon is because he felt he could stop it. Of course, that would render his prediction incorrect, but that's okay. As long as the right future came out, he didn't really care. Alex was also one of those folks who felt that anybody could learn to perceive. It's a matter of learning something we have. You can learn to notice things with, with, within your range of sight. You can learn to hear better, not, hear, not necessarily hear better, not to increase your hearing range, but to hear more of what is actually there. You can learn to smell more 
That may not be a good thing, but you can learn to smell more <laughs> of what is actually there. And the same thing with touch and everything else. And Alex proceeded along that idea. He suggested that what people do is spend some time. He said he actually found this in a book on memory training. And strangely enough, I think it was Al Koran, one of his books. Jim knows who that is. Um, was that to improve your memory, you notice things consciously. You attend to them. You pay attention. So for five minutes a day, you pay attention. You stay in one place, but you pay attention visually to everything around you. Then you shift to your sense of hearing. You notice the background sounds above. Background sounds of the dog barking in the background. You then shift to your sense of smell, your sense of taste, which won't take five minutes unless you're eating something, which is not a bad idea. So just focus on different tastes at that point. And then you focus on your sense of touch, which also might not be much unless you gave yourself something to touch, except if you think about it, we got something touches, touching us all the time. We got our clothes touching us. Our rear ends are touching chairs. Our feet are touching the ground. We have things going on, and we can feel hot or cold in different parts of our body. We can feel perhaps pain or, or discomfort, and you can focus on all that. And what Alex found by working with people on this is if you focus this way for several days, and if he said it doesn't take very long, and I've done a little bit of myself, you suddenly notice little extras. <laughs> it's like, where did that come from? I didn't see it, hear it, smell it, feel it, or taste it. But there's something in my perception that's from nowhere. That's the psychic perceptions. The problem is that that signal, because our adaptation to the rest of the world and the way we're taught to focus on certain things, we're taught to not attend to the little voice in the back of our head. And you need to consciously attend to that. And what then happens is you'll start noticing it more and more. And hopefully it's not a little voice. <laughs> because if it is a little voice, you may have to talk to somebody else about that. Because it really could be a little voice from the outside, or it could be a little voice from inside, too. All that primary focus on perception is important because in reality, when we're dealing with the world, we can only deal with it through our perceptions. If we're talking about psychic abilities, we're talking about additional signals. And the, and the fact is that if I get all sorts of stuff out there about the world around me, is it useful to me? The reason I'm not noticing a lot of things in the world, visually or auditorily, is that they're not useful. We learn to screen them out because they're not important, unless they're sudden blasts of light, flashes, flares, movement, sudden movement, all the things that could affect our, our safety. Same thing with sounds, sudden sounds, sudden physical sensations. Well, isn't it strange that most people report issues of precognitions of death or disaster or harm? People talk about getting scared or freaked out by a perception. That's a safety adaptation. That's for survival. That makes perfect sense. That's why those signals are more important. But when people start looking at it, over the years, um, in my, from our four books, I've been getting surveys from people. And I found it really interesting in looking at the experiences that people report back to me. Because people are surprised when they start having, really looking at their experiences, especially their psychic dreams. That for the most part, they people do have a lot of psychic dreams, a lot of precognitive dreams. But they're so stupid and mundane that they would never think to tell anybody unless somebody asked. Such as, oh, you know, three people you're going to see on the way to work tomorrow who you haven't seen in years. You know, or, more importantly, the fact that your latte tomorrow is going to be made wrong. Or that the next car running by you, which is not going to hurt you at all, is an unusual new kind of car. I mean, just really simple, mundane things. People have perceptions like that, psychic perceptions, all the time. They aren't important. And the other side of it is, you know, when, uh, and this is, uh, talking to the skeptics is kind of interesting sometimes because I have, and they're always talking about how people don't report, you know, there's only these few reports of ghosts once in a while, and that's true. And it's something that I learned from J. Allen Hynek about UFOs, and it's called a reporting artifact. The fact is that if you have a positive experience with a ghost, there is rarely a reason for you to call anyone for help. I do occasionally get those calls. Hi, uh, Mr. Auerbach, we have a ghost in our house. Um, just wanted you to know. <laughs> Come visit if you want. It happens it's maybe once a year at the most, but it's very rare because people don't need help. And if they know what they've got, they don't need an explanation. And that's the only two reasons that people typically call. They want either an explanation or they want help. Help might be getting rid of the ghost. Help might be learning to live with the ghost, if there is a ghost. But then there is the issue of perception of the whole world and reality. When we perceive 
the world around us, there's another added dimension that we're looking at in parapsychology that it relates to clairvoyance and to psychometry. The idea of clairvoyance is not just remote viewing, looking at a distance. It might be holding an object and feeling its history, getting a read off an object. And psychics talk about this. This is something that, that people have done for ages. In fact, uh, there are psychics who have, in fact, worked with archaeologists who will hold the finds and get a feel for them and actually are able to give more description about what, what's down there or where these things came from. Uh, an anthrop anthropologist, actually an archaeologist at Northwestern who was doing a dig in southern Illinois actually used a, a couple psychics and they were able to get additional information which of course people would say, okay, you can't verify that, but they actually got enough information that pieced together with other pieces of a puzzle they were trying to figure out, like where certain artifacts came from that were not native to the area, but because the psychics gave them the clue, so to speak, they knew where to look, what to look for, and they found it. Objects hold history hold information. This is part of our psychic perception. And something about the world allows us human beings to pick up information, which is why you can walk into a place and sometimes feel creeped out. Now, granted, sometimes it's the decor or smell <laughs> or the people, but a lot of times we also walk into places and just immediately feel at home. There's something about this place that just feels great. If you walk into a place where there's been a lot of fighting, a lot of family domestic violence, people feel it. We sense it. It's all perception. Somehow there's a level of perception that's going on that we're sensing things somehow that's in the environment, and this is something we're trying to figure out. Now, strangely enough, um, in talking to some skeptics about it, the idea that we can pick up history is not so far-fetched to many people. In fact, it may be something e much easier to explain because it may also have to do with the structure in the brain. If information is recorded, Remember, we're in the information age right now. We have information bouncing through us at this moment, not just psychically, but otherwise. We have more data being streamed right through us all at this point than humanity has ever had. If, you, if we could somehow pick it up, we'd freak out. We'd be overloaded, totally. And that's probably why we don't pick up every bit of history wherever we go. Because you would be freaked out unless you knew how to handle it, how to deal with that, that much information at one time. There's a reason why we're not all psychic all the time. And the reason is, unless we're taught how to deal with that amount of information, you can deal with total overload and freak out. And unfortunately, people do. Psychiatrists often talk about people who are hearing voices, schizophrenics, maybe not. Montague Ullman in New York, a, a psychiatrist who's been involved in parapsychology for years, actually worked with several schizophrenics who, in a way that was a little different. When he dealt with people who said that they were hearing voices, he asked them, okay, whose voices are they? That's number one. A lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, the voices of the people around them, the voices of the crowd. And he was able to get out of them that, it was, that they were picking up the thoughts. Not just hearing voices, they were picking up the thoughts. As if their shield had dropped. Well, he, he taught them using some of the psychic traditions of visualizations to erect shields. Now, skeptics would say, that's not going to help. That doesn't work. Guess what? It worked. Not for all of them, because not all of them were perhaps hearing other people's voices in their heads. They were perhaps hearing voices in their own heads. But it did work for a lot of those folks. They were able to erect a shield and bounce it all back. They had a psychic opening, and they had overload. And we get calls like that all the time from people who just don't know how to deal with it. They really can't deal with it. Too much perception is not a good thing, unless you know how to focus and attend to the information. Um, I don't know if any of you are um, stimulation junkies, like to be in, in rooms that have lots of stuff, and then there are people who can't be around rooms that have lots of stuff. You can tell by the decor of people's homes, whether they're minimalists or stuff-oriented, what's going on. And it's real interesting, because people who are stuff-oriented get edgy if there's not enough to see. And people who are the other way around get freaked out or overloaded and get headaches if there's too much to see. So it's all about perception and how we deal with it. Psi is no different. In fact, it's very much the same. Now, um, I mentioned psychokinesis. And I mentioned it for a good reason. Now, psychokinesis deals with, uh, it's mind over matter. And uh, we're dealing with, at this point, the idea we can affect things. Now, there is a perception issue here. If, you, if something is moving and you see it move, there's a perception of the object moving. 
<laughs> if you're holding a key and it bends in your hand, there's a perception that you're feeling it change, and then you open your hand, you see it bent. There's a perception there. But the idea with psychokinesis is something physically, objectively changes in the environment that can be seen by everybody. In a poltergeist case, if something is moving, people see, perhaps may not see it actually physically moving, but they'll see that it has moved. It has changed its position in space. That's very different. But how, <coughs> how we perceive the world around us may actually cause certain things to happen in certain ways. OK, look, not all nine of spades. It's OK, it's not that kind of trick anyway. Now, years ago, uh, when I came to California, somebody tried to convince me that you could teach a deck of cards a trick by talking to it for five minutes every day. You know, I'm a ne naive New Yorker. So I decided to try it. And lo and behold, I learned that you could teach a deck of cards one trick. Only one because you, as everyone knows, you can't teach old decks new tricks. Make sure you look at the cards and uh, show people around you. Of course, also when I was told to California, people were asking me from New York, they said, so are you going to California to find yourself? So I figured the trick I would teach the cards would be to find themselves. Put your card right on top. Right on top. On top. OK, now I'm going to back away slowly <laughs> so you can all see. People say, OK, he turned his back. Think of your card. Think about seeing your card. This is objective reality. Is that your card? That's it. Okay. Good boy. <laughs> Mary, yours is eager. And Mary, pick the nine of spades. Yeah, give her a big hand. <laughs> OK, let's see if I can do, use this water bottle here. Actually, I'll use back a bunch of books here. I'd like you to think of your card. <laughs> you thought real hard about it, didn't you? Is that your card, King Hearts? Yeah, you say so. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Mind over matter is not just um, physical change. It actually goes back to the root of perception. Uh, it's how we perceive our body in space. In fact, when I move my body, I am making my mind move my matter. It still is the same idea. It's intention moving something. The same process, just extended outward, is what we consider psychokinesis in many respects. And there's a spatial position. You know, one of the things about psychokinesis has been a mystery for all of us, is that it, if something's moving in another room and I'm causing it, well, first of all, I'm not there to see it move. So how did I know where it was to begin with and make it move to the right place? If something is bending, there have been some unusual chemical changes or physical structure changes in spoons and other things that have been bent paranormally. Uh, at those spoon bending parties, many, many things are bent with strength with people in a slightly altered state. But there are many, many things that are not bent that way. And cross sections of the metal in those cases indicate that something unusual happened. There's a melting going on in the structure of the, the grains of the metal. Very unusual. But how did my, not my brain know to do that instead of simply extending a force, like in comic books, and doing this or increasing my strength somehow? How did it know? There is a, and actually, think about this. You, you've all heard the apocryphal story of the woman who was thrown out of a car. Car rolls over. Her son or daughter is trapped in the car. She runs over, lifts up the car with one hand, pulls out the kid with the other, lets it crash, right? Uh, that has happened. And a number of years ago, um, I was fortunate enough, although I don't think these two doctors thought it was fortunate when I raised these issues, but I was fortunate enough to, to be at a party and talking to a couple of doctors about this. They were very skeptical about the whole mind over matter thing and all about parapsychology and stuff. And I asked them if they'd ever read anything in a journal about an examination of, of a man or woman who had done this and those, because we've heard about this for decades. And it happens in many different parts of the country. And always the, the excuse or explanation is what? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. No, 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 no. Not going to work. 
Um, they actually said, the two of them worked at the same hospital in Marin, they said that they actually, three months before, had had a case come into the emergency room. One was an orthopedic surgeon, the other was in the emergency room. This woman was about 5'2", weighed about 110 pounds. She had been thrown from her pickup truck. Uh, her son was in there. She lifted it up with one hand. People saw this and pulled him out, let it drop. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I asked them a couple of questions. Did you examine this woman? Yes. Was she hurt? She had bruises some scratches from being thrown from the car. Okay. Now, I want, you to, I want to ask you this, and I asked directly of the orth orthopedic surgeon. Someone picks up a pickup truck with one hand, should there be or not any damage to the muscles or bones of the body? And the guy looks at the other doctor, and the other doctor looks back, and they both said, pardon my language, shit. <laughs> they both examined this woman, no torn ligaments, no broken bones, no sprains, nothing. She was perfectly okay, except for the contusions or that she had got from being thrown from the truck. That made no sense to them. And I said to them, weren't you even curious? And they said, it just never occurred to them. They never even thought about it, because they weren't looking for it. She was fine. And they even heard the story before the examiner, because she told it a number of times, apparently. Now, what happened there? Well, that's a quite an important question. And the answer might be one of several things, because it's perception of what actually happened. Did this woman's strength increase? Now, adrenaline can speed up your reactions. It's not going to give tensile strength to bone or muscle. It's not going to increase strength in that way. We are stronger than we think we are, but we're not that much stronger, and there's a limit to what the human body can take in many respects. So what did this woman actually experience? Well, she experienced picking this kid out. That's all she experienced. She didn't experience, she knew it was kind of happening, but that's about all she experienced. So was her strength increased by her mind? Were her bones somehow shored up or shielded? Or, this is what I think is going on, did the car move? She could probably have let go and it still would have moved. Unfortunately, had she let go and, it saw it, and she saw it moving, she might have freaked out. Keeping her hand on the car is a security blanket because things seem within the realm of possibility. Psychokinesis, above everything else, has a boggle threshold that we often approach because we know things don't work this way. Uh, I want to recommend a book called The PK Man by Jeffrey Mishloff, which came out uh, a few months ago, about a guy named Ted Owens who claimed he could control the weather and do all sorts of other bizarre things. And over the years, and Jeffrey looking at it, he found that there may have been some truth to this. As weird and strange as his claims actually seemed and as, as unethical as the guy himself actually was, an amoral. Didn't care if anybody got hurt during his demonstrations. He just needed to demonstrate and prove his, his point. So things are based on our perceptions and our belief systems. We expect things to happen within a certain range. And so if you raise the bar, if everyone suddenly believed that we could move objects, we probably could. Could we move big objects? You know, probably not. You know why? We couldn't believe it. There's a limit to what's going on. Uh, Martin Caden, who was a science fiction writer I worked with years, uh, a few years ago before his death in 97, was able to move objects. Uh, Marty was a bulldog of a guy. He wrote the Six Million Dollar Man book, Cyborg. Uh, he wrote a number of books that were made into films, including Marooned, which, which actually led to the Apollo Soyuz mission. And he was the guy that NASA actually called if they had a question about their history. Uh, he was intimately involved, actually, since the beginning of, of the space program. Um, science journalist and science fiction writer, and right out of Indiana Jones, in many respects, um, <coughs> with claims that some people said were crazy. Uh, but Marty wasn't crazy. Uh, when I first met this guy, th let's talk about perception here for a second. I'm getting excited about meeting a science fiction writer who I'd read a lot of books from. This is what I, I was going to speak at a conference with this guy, and, and I was really getting excited. I wanted to talk to him because he's an incredible writer. He wrote all sorts of stuff about science. I had no idea, except for one book he wrote called Ghosts of the Air. I didn't know he had a real intense interest in the paranormal. And three days before I go to Nebraska, where this conference is, I come home from teaching a class at JFK. This is synchronicity. This is perception again. I turn on the TV. I start flipping channels. I hear the name Martin Caden as I'm flipping channels, and I stop on a show called Stunt Masters which I certainly have never watched before. And there's Martin Caden on a, in a segment in Stuntmasters where they're covering 
He was also an aviator, and they were covering his setting the world record of the number of people on, walking on the wing of a plane. He had 19 people walking on the wing of a Ju-52 bomber, 5,000 feet, barely, on one wing, barely able to keep it going. So I'm thinking, okay, this guy is really out there. <laughs> if you saw this guy, and you, you come up and uh, take a look at my book, there's pictures of him in the book. Uh, so I get to the conference, and Marty is, uh, where there's going to be a press conference in the, you know, how many press people come to a conference in Lincoln, Nebraska? You know, Marty and I both knew, or all of us knew there was, so there's actually more people on the panel than there are press people. Uh, and there's only five of us on the panel <laughs> at this point. Uh, so Marty starts making a couple statements about the skeptics, and he said, tonight I will move some objects in front of a full audience. And I'm thinking, this is new. Usually if somebody claims to do some psychokinesis, there's something else going on. And he said he'd move objects. I'm thinking, okay, I, I gotta see this. Now, my skepticism was evoked even though I have seen things move because of the way he was claiming this. Of course, this is a guy who took 19 people up on the wing of a plane. <laughs> so I didn't know what to think. That night, uh, he and his wife uh, got up and started talking about the fact that he's learned to move small objects, turn small targets, under glass, uh, even in a vacuum, apparently. And he said, you just got to get past your disbelief. It's like science fiction. You have to suspend your disbelief. So he says, I need somebody to help me set up some targets up here. So I jumped out of my seat. You know, this is the magician parapsychologist who's going to help out. And um, I'm noticing that the materials for these things are pieces of wax, needles, candy wrappers, paper, aluminum foil, the most innocuous, strange items that I've ever seen. And they're all in little pyramid shapes, and they sit on top of the needle sticking out of the piece of wax so they can move freely. Stuck underneath an aquarium tank. We had two different aquarium tanks there. And, we, and I, we set up probably 20 targets in each one of these little dis, dif, different tanks. Put some stuff around the base so that it wouldn't, some clay so it wouldn't get any air currents there from the table, up through the tables. And he sits there and he starts looking at them. Now there's probably about 300 people in the audience at this point. And he's sitting there staring at these and he's talking about what's going on. And he says, not concentrating. If you concentrate, you're going to get a headache. It's seeing it move and believing it moves and then just simply letting it move. He said, the letting it move is the most important thing. And nothing happens for a little while, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not letting it move. <laughs> Certainly nobody else is. And then all of a sudden I notice one of these targets slowly start to turn. And then a second one in the same thing, away from the first one, slowly starts to turn in the opposite direction. And the more of them start turning, and the same thing's going on on the other side. Now, I put these things together. There are no magnets involved. There's no air currents that I can see. Even if there was an air current, this is the strangest air current I've ever seen because I set them up so that some were higher than others. And some of the ones that were underneath others were turning, and some of the ones that were on top of others were turning where the other one's not moving. Very bizarre selective air currents, microcurrents. Well, what did I say? I said, Marty, I owe you an apology. He says, what for? You made a claim, and I, I didn't even know what to think of it. He said, well, what do you think now? I said, I think it's happening. He says, okay. Apology accepted. <laughs> so over the next several, a couple of years, I actually worked with the guy. I went to his house in Florida. He had a really intricate setup, uh, including a closed room, so that he could actually sit outside the room, look through a glass pane, and have all these targets set up. And again, I was very, not skeptical, but I went in there to make sure this is my, the magician part of me coming out, and this is the parapsychologist had been fooled thing in the back of my mind happening. And, um, I didn't actually think he was fooling me or even trying to fool me at that point for another reason, and that was the fact that I had been given, um, uh, my family, my father was with NBC for a number of years and actually was the director of the NBC news coverage of the Mercury and Gemini space shots. And when I told my dad I'd met Martin Caden, he said, oh, I knew Marty years ago, and this is actually while I'm at the convention, so when I mentioned my father's name to Marty, there was an instant reaction, and I heard a lot more about my father than my father probably wanted me to know. <laughs> about his early days, uh, as well as some other news people that I actually knew through NBC, and they're all big buddies with Marty. And so they had nothing but good things to say about this guy. This is not a guy who was going to try to fake out a parapsychologist. He had things moving at his house, a lot of things moving in these things. And he taught me how to do it, and it had to do with seeing it move. It was interesting, when we did a couple of workshops, people could only do it after they saw him do it, or saw somebody else do it. In fact, I was convinced that if I faked it, as long as they saw it moving and thought it was happening, it would have happened for everybody. The group in Nebraska, we had about 50% uh, of the 100 people moving the targets. A group we did in Marin County, we had about 30% of the people moving targets. And one woman whose husband was a physicist, and, and she said basically her husband was going to be very upset with her 
because she could sit down and just make the things go whichever direction she wanted it to. And, sh and I talked to her a week later, and she was still able to do it. She's still able to do it, apparently, uh, much to the consternation of her husband, the physicist. He doesn't believe it. He still sees it. He just doesn't believe it. It's our perceptions of how things work. Marty, strangely enough, had this perception and belief system that he couldn't move things if they were too big. I sat him down to watch The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> A particular scene where Luke, is, Luke Skywalker and Yoda are in Dagobah, and he can't raise that ship out of the water because he couldn't, couldn't do it. It was just too big. Marty said, intellectually, I understand this. I'm just not there yet. He wasn't at a point where he felt he could get past that next threshold. Because he said, seeing somebody levitate, that would just be too much for me. We perceive the world in a certain way. We expect it to work in a certain way, and it does. I'm going to take a, we'll take a break here in a second. I just want to do a couple of quick things, a little bit of magic. Speaking of perception, I have a deck of cards here. All right. Um, somebody want to shuffle them for me? Would you shuffle them for me? Okay. Here, catch. You got them in your left hand there. It was a good catch. <laughs> Could you shuffle them, please? You got to take them out of the box first. Oh. <laughs> to give the box to him, to, the, the guy next to you to hold. Okay, good. Okay. Give the cards a shuffle. What's your name? Alyssa. Alyssa? Yeah. All right, Alyssa. When you feel like they're shuffled well enough, okay, okay. hold them so you can just fan them all in one hand, if you would. Okay. And try to hold them in one hand, because you're going to need your other hand now. Now, you may not need to see them all, as long as you see one that you actually like. See a card that you like? Yeah. Good. Pull it out. No, no, no. You got two there. Put one back, please. Thank you. Okay. Now, look at that card. Mesmerize it. I mean, memorize it. <laughs> know what it is. Show everybody else. These windows are not reflective enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> And hold it facing me now. So turning it, all the other cards are facing you, and that card's facing me, right? Okay. Put it back in the deck, face down. All the other cards are face up. Shuffle the cards again. People, watch her make sure she does that. <laughs> and put them back in the box. <laughs> and give them a high toss so I can catch them. Here, feel it. Feel the bag. There's something there. Okay, you're there. Okay. <laughs> Was there something there before? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Alyssa shuffled a deck of cards that weren't there. Very well, I might add. You took a card out. You put it face. Did she do it? Yep. Okay, good. Close the card. So you, there's one card facing opposite to the rest of the cards in this deck. All right, let me pull out the cards. Well, they're in there. I can feel them. Must be on the other side. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're there, but yeah, here they are. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> the zipper. <laughs> Things don't always behave the way that they look. Okay. Alyssa, what was the name of your card? King of Hearts. The King of Hearts. Get these cards out. You say the King of Hearts. It should be in here somewhere. Oh, there's, oh, there's I must have gone past it before. There's a face down card. Alyssa? Please take out the face down card. Okay. Take a look at it and show it to everybody. Right. Now, let's talk about perception for a second. If I had asked you the name of that card before I started playing with the bag, what would you all have thought? I was doing something in the bag, right? 
So it has to do with timing also, perception of time and, and where things happen, when things happen, is the way we reconstruct things as well. Okay. Let's do uh, one more piece here. This, this is also perception in some respects, although I really can't, but we're going to do something along the lines of perception. I'm going to have you help me with this. You can stay right there. Hold these. Now, <coughs> for the cheap seats, okay? Got a red, red deck and a, and a blue deck. I want you to look at these cards. I'm going to look away. Let me go, go through the cards, as many as you want me to. Remember one of the ones you see. Okay. Get a good look at it. Yes, let me go past it. You can let me go way past it if you want to, or all the way through. Okay, okay but just remember one of the cards you actually see. Okay. okay? Got one? Okay, good. All right. In that deck, don't tell me where the card is. I have actually removed one card from that deck. I hope I remember to remove the card. Um, pull the deck out. Yeah, take, make sure you look at all the cards. Look at the cards face up and go through and find your card, the duplicate for your card. Because on that card is written something absolutely amazing. No, wait, that's another trick. Is your card there? No, I don't see it. That is a different trick. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I removed your card and placed it in this deck. What was your card? A five of spades. Take the five of spades, which should be a blue backed card. <laughs> we'll take a break now. <laughs> Come back. I'll talk just for a couple minutes more and take some questions. All right. okay. Help yourself to, to the um, scary coffee over here. Most people don't, real, don't know this. His father was actually a very famous magician, and Harry avoided magic for a long time. In fact, he became a TV producer <coughs> for CBS. He was one of the producers of the Smothers Brothers show during the 1960s. Um, and then he went back into magic after his, uh, after his father had left, left the magic field. According to Harry Blackstone, Jr., all illusions ultimately take place in the mind of the person who perceives them. They're the result of the brain's interpretation or misinterpretation of clues that it receives from the usual five senses. Actually six, again, because of our sense of balance. These illusions are at the same time both positive and negative in nature. They're positive illusions in the sense that the audience sees something which in reality does not exist. And they're negative illusions in that the audience does not see something by overlooking it or misinterpreting it that does not exist. Uh, or that does exist, rather. If you put your keys down, and you look for them later, and they're gone. And you come back, and they're back. And no one else is home, and your cat or dog has not picked them up. There's a couple possibilities. Number one, your mind, for whatever reason, is preventing you from seeing those keys. It's a negative hallucination. You're not seeing something that is physically there. The other possibility is what many of um, my colleagues, actually, uh, Julian Isaacs coined this term. The term is JOT, J-O-T-T. -T. It refers to when things move and they come back, very innocuous things. JOT stands for just one of those things. <laughs> Keith Harari swears that where they go in that intervening time is to the same place the sock goes when you lose it in the dryer. But because keys are made of metal, they get bounced back. He suggested putting a clip on every one of your socks and you'll never lose them. That's illusion and perception, of course, in and of itself. And actually, it's interesting because people have that experience all the time. And it's more ex interesting when everybody's looking for your keys and nobody can find them and it, you all turn around and boom, it's there. Things escape our perceptions often because we need them too much. And there's some part of us that just goes, <laughs> somehow. Now, our perceptions of psychic ability, we actually have not just the perceptions of psi that we experience, we also have perceptions that we learn about or that affect our beliefs. The perceptions are the beliefs and statements of other people. Uh, there was a recent study, I just pulled this off, um, 
a service. This is from the uh, Des Moines Register in Iowa City. Uh, this is a paranormal study. People who scoff at alien abductions in haunted houses are likely to change their minds if their friends believe, according to a University of Iowa study. Uh, Barry Markovsky, a sociology professor, said his findings explain why belief in astrology, the Bermuda Triangle, and other paranormal phenomena can spread quickly even if they have no basis. In fact, obviously a skeptic. Most people don't have personal experience with these things, so those beliefs are coming from someone, Markovsky said. See, to me, this stuff, I, just so you all know, I didn't have a psychic experience to bring me into parapsychology. I just grew up on the wrong TV shows. So the media did impact me in that sense. But it also made, it just like, it wasn't like ESP didn't make sense. It made sense to me. It made sense that people could do this. It, it was not outside my realm of uh, the way the world worked. It makes sense that people can move objects. But that's probably because I read comic books. Um, People tend not to realize the extent to which they are adopting beliefs of the people around them. In one experiment, participants were told that some people believe pyramids have mysterious powers to keep things fresh. This is obviously somebody doing some old work. For instance, the ancient Egyptians used pyramids as tombs to preserve the bodies of pharaohs. Using two equally fresh bananas, researchers had subjects compare one stored in a box and another stored in a pyramid-shaped container. Subjects were also, who were alone tended to consider the pieces of fruit equally fresh. When other subjects heard a person they thought was another test subject say the banana in the pyramid was fresher, they were likely to agree. They continued to hold the belief even after the other person left the room. The effect was even stronger when the subject believed that the other person was a college professor or someone equally influential. Uh, the study's results are in the current issue of sociology, Sociological Perspectives. And um, it says, recently, this is a quote from him, from Markovsky, recently there have been a lot of alien abduction books and movies on TV. Now some huge proportion of the country believes that aliens are abducting humans for research. You know, hard to say, but as a friend of mine from France said, they don't abduct this many people in France. <laughs> so I guess the aliens either have a deal with our government or something else is going on. Um, we get our beliefs from other people. We get our perceptions from other people. We learn. I mean, we're educated into certain belief systems. When you have a psychic experience, you may ignore it because you're afraid to tell someone and just kind of suppress it. You may ignore it because it makes no sense that this could actually happen. You may ignore it because you're afraid of it, which unfortunately happens to too many people. Why? Because it's weird. And we certainly in this country don't want to be weird, which is kind of strange when you think about it, considering that no one is normal in this country. Uh, and it's just a matter of perception of other people's beliefs. And unfortunately, the media feeds the frenzy of all this. The media makes it seem weirder or makes it seem stranger. And we really need to consider normalizing it and make it part of our normal perceptions. Because there is nothing extraordinary about psychic experience. The only thing is that it is extra. It's hard to get at because of our other perceptions. When we're dealing with psychic experience, we have to consider that anything we get is not just filtered by our perceptions, our other senses. This is why that exercise that Alex Tanis talked about can work, because you can screen out. You'll know when it's not happening. But then there's the other problem. It's the other shoe. It's called interpretation. We interpret our experience. And then we misremember it later on. We might reconstruct it differently to make it fit the way the world works or the way we're mo more comfortable with the world. When things are drastically different enough, that's when people get freaked out. Or that's when people suddenly think that they're psychics, which is not necessarily, you know, uh, Keith and other researchers in parapsychology have a hard time in that term alone because that's like saying, I'm an artist. <clears throat> well, you know, everybody's psychic. Everybody has some creative ability. So in some respects, we are all artists. But are you a good artist? <laughs> Is your art good? Is your psychic perception good? Are you a good hearer? <laughs> Are you a good feeler? Well, that's a hard different thing to get into. You have to consider the way we perceive these people also. Belief has been tied to psychic experience. Uh, Gertrude Schmeiler first did the, sh the sheep goat effect research back in the 1940s, showing that believers tend to score above chance and disbelievers tend to score below. That has been looked at by the skeptics and dismissed uh, more recently. But of course, they only looked at the initial studies. They haven't looked at the more recent studies, which are very interesting because that same belief system is, uh, distinction is also applied to psychokinesis research. Bob Morris, when he was at the university, at Syracuse University doing work on psychokinesis, took people and see, to see if they could affect computers. But he didn't just take people. He took people who hated computers and people who 
liked computers. This wasn't just a belief in Psy, this was a belief in computers. Guess what? The people who hated computers screwed up the computers. The people who, in other words, they had more of a psychokinetic impact than the people who liked computers. They were malfunction linked rather than function linked. Then again, there are those people in the computer industry, and, I, and having worked in that industry for a number of years, I know, and I've talked to a lot of them, that can make computers do things that they shouldn't oughta. You know, having a computer years ago, talking to a guy who actually could walk in uh, and almost do a laying on of hands on a broken computer to make it boot back up, could fix things just by touching them. There are those mechanics who can do that. They don't make a lot of money, <laughs> but they can do those sorts of things. And, and the computer industry, they're considered really good consultants because obviously they can turn around and, and just say, oh, it's done. It's fixed. Unfortunately, there are those people sitting there who broke it to begin with because their minds were in that place. It's perceptions of technology. And it could be a, a misperception of technology in the sense that a lot of those same people who said that people can affect computers mentally by their moods, the mood that they, that the reason they're affecting the computer is not a psychic thing. This is where we get into misperception even of statements. If I say that somebody hates computers, screws up their computer, when we're talking in a group like this, you know, it's natural to assume that psychokinesis. But it also could be that the person hates the computer, hits the computer jams it, pounds it, hits the wrong buttons. And you know what? It's true. I've seen people do that. So it's perception. It's the context in which you describe things as well. So whenever you're talking about psychic, because it is nebulous at this point, and because it's filtered by our other senses, and because it's in the background so often, you need to play around a little bit with getting at the meat of what's going on, and then integrating it. When it comes right down to the advice, when people ask me about going to see a psychic, um, I tell them there's a couple reasons to see a psychic, what you get out of it. In other words, if you're paying somebody for a psychic reading, A, you're being entertained. That's a very good reason to pay a psychic or reader. If you're getting it, now, if you're not getting entertained, if you're going for entertainment and that's not what you're getting, then you better be getting useful information. Because if they've kind of failed in both of those categories, they suck. They're not good psychics and they're not good phony psychics. You know, so, there, is, there are two reasons why someone might, see some, might actually get something out of it. And the fact is that valuable information, if I get a psychic perception of something going on across town, is it useful to me? If it is, great. If it's not, I don't care. And that's where we have to kind of pull back from the whole emphasis of being more psychic. We should be more psychic about ourselves, more psychic about our world and not the world around us. It should be about things that affect our lives, because that's what our perceptions, our senses actually do. Our senses are about our world. We gather information through other sources that affect our world. So if we can use Psy to gather more news information out there that might impact our belief system, our daily lives, because it affects the economy, great. Otherwise, you know, maybe you can find out the sports score without going online or checking on the radio. That could affect your world as well. But you have to think about what the personal impact is because we think about that with our normal senses also. Psi needs to be integrated into perception in the same way. And unfortunately, by emphasizing it as this weird thing out there, it becomes that weird thing out there, when in fact it's a perfectly normal piece of our lives. I'm going to stop right there. And actually, I'm going to do uh, a couple demonstrations here and take some questions while I'm doing them, too. So, Let's see. Do I see something serious or funny? Serious. serious. Both. <laughs> Both. Serious. Both is harder. We'll do serious. Okay. Um, I need somebody who would like to have a little psychic reading. Tarot reading, actually, I should say, not a psychic reading. Come on up. Just one second, chill. Now, I, I do know Jill. I've met Jill before. I'm going to do part, two part. Uh, what I, I like to play, kind of play around with my readings a little bit. Um, I do them very differently than a lot of other people because I'm testing myself as well at the same time. So now I'm going to make a prediction of something of a couple of the cards. I'm doing this based on the imagery I'm getting here. Okay. Oops. Well, 
Okay. I'm going to leave this right here, Sanford. Okay. All right. Now, we have the traditional weight tarot deck. And I'm just going to split the cards up here, I think. All right. Okay, uh, Jill, we're going to do actually do three cards from each half. I want you to pick a half to start with. That half? Okay, great. <coughs> um, pick up the cards. Oh, you know what? Let me give them a quick shuffle first. Okay, pick them up now. And start dealing them down face down. And I'd like you to deal, we'll add a little humor to this too. I'd like you to, to just deal down until you feel like it's a good time to stop. Don't let me influence you at all. There's a good time to stop? Mm -hmm. You have a card in your hand, you want to put it on top here or not? Yeah. Okay. All right, now Jill, after we're done with this, and you see what I've got written on this piece of paper over here, you're going to wonder that if you had stopped somewhere else or at some other point, would the outcome have been different? Mm -hmm. So do you want to stick where you are or do you want to continue? Because tomorrow morning, you're going to have a question in your mind as to whether or not the outcome would have been very different if you had taken a few back. You sure you want to stay where you are? Of course I, it would be in my mind, but right now I want to stay where I am. Because next week. <laughs> no, no, okay, you can stay right there. All right. <laughs> Pick up the cards and deal them in, <laughs> in three piles. One, two, three, one, two, three, and keep going like that, yeah. Oh, even numbers. That was very convenient. But you know, if you had thought about it <laughs> next week. <laughs> they might not have come out like that. That might not have come out like that. Okay. Turn over the first card. Which Whichever you feel is the first card. Okay. First card is the Four of Swords. Now, we have a, to me, this, this represents solitude and repose. Someone is lying observing something. And swords typically may have to do with work or kind of ambition-related situations. There's a wait-and-see situation happening here that I see for your future. I want to kind of bring all the cards together on these three. So take the next card, the card, top card in the next pile. Well, work and money go together. Queen of Pentacles. Uh, this could represent you or it could be another woman who is going to, in this case, affect the outcome of whatever it is you're going to be thinking about, a decision you're going to be thinking about. Okay, okay and this is, uh, I see it as a, not necessarily a big decision. Well, it might be. I have to take a look at the other cards. Look at the, the, the last card here in the piles. Ah, the magician. That card represents a person taking control of the elements. This indicates that whether this is you or someone else affecting the decision, you, you need to take control of this. So as a decision comes up, if you get advice from someone else, go with your gut, go with your instincts. Okay. okay, but think about it overnight. Sleep on it, whatever that decision actually is. Now, Sanford, would you take that slightly torn piece of paper out there and read what's on the front? Or pass it back to someone else who can read? <laughs> Suspense. Suspense. <laughs> Magician, the Queen of, of Pet, Petricoles, Petricoles? Oh my goodness. and the Four of Swords. That's awesome. <laughs> but wait, thank you. There's more. We're not done. I get to see more when I make you read awesome. for Yes, you do. Okay. And you almost stopped the devil, so that's a good thing. All right, Jill, on these, we're going to do them a little differently. I'm going to read them a little differently. I'm not going to predict anything here. I'd like you to pull out one card part way. Now, you may take the, the card on either side or the two above or the two below. Which would you like? Plus the card itself, which oh, was this one. Okay. okay, so let's just put these aside. Okay. All right. Place your hand on top of them, flat on top of them. I'm going to read them without looking. It's more fun for me. 
take the top card, the first one, and look at it. Now I'm going to get an overall feel for all three cards. I'm going to have to probably ask you a couple questions here. Is there a person on this card? That's a safe bet. <laughs> Is there a person on this card? Not so safe. <laughs> Is there part of a person on this card? Yes. Because I, I'm, I'm getting some, a grasping feeling. I'm also getting something about creativity um, and a oneness of creativity. Okay. I'm going to have to say that this, there's, there's a hand. Creativity usually is represented by the wand. So uh, this is the ace of wands, is that correct? Okay. This card actually represents a creative push for you. This, may, this deals back with your decision has to do with creativity and work. Something to do with that, with making money, but around creativity. Let's take the next card. Is there a person on this card? I'm getting a couple of conflicting images. Is this person seated in a th seated or no, no, the person's kneeling. Is is kneeling? Kneeling? Okay. And I see water around the person, is that right? Correct. Okay, good. Um, I, I'm sensing this has, this is okay, I'm not even gonna say that. This card I'm sensing represents a goal in, in a slightly different way. It represents hope. Um, it's Represent the person is actually involved in something, but it, the card itself represents a goal reaching for something. It's, it's hope reaching for a star. It's the star. Okay. The creativity and work should be a goal that you've had for yourself for a long time. Okay, so I'm right on the star? Okay. Just put your, finger, your hand back down on that other, the last card. Don't even pick it up. Because I'm sensing something that's very important here. Regardless of everything else, the decision going with your gut, there's one thing you must keep in mind. That one thing is the piece that I'm getting to this last card. You must keep balance in your life. It's extremely important to do that. Keep your life balanced. Reflect on it. But keep it balanced because this card has to do with justice. Ooh. Take a look at the card. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Okay. And the last thing I'd like to do here, I'm going to do everybody. This is a little perception here. First, let's do it with a couple people. Put your glasses back on, Sanford. <laughs> I'll get back to you in a second. <laughs> Susan, think of one of the cards. Got one? Think of one. Think one of these five. All right. <coughs> is it gone? Yes. Okay. Good. I know that screwed up your sound, David, but that's just too bad. <laughs> Sanford, think of one of the cards. Okay. Got it. It's gone? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, I'm going to project out a thought to everyone. I want you to look at these five cards and think of one of the cards. Think of one. Take a one, get one, one of the cards, get one of the cards. Lori, get one of the cards, okay. Take one of the cards, Pam. Okay, I see it. Take one of the cards. Get one, everybody got one? Okay. This is the hardest thing. I don't usually get 100%. We'll see how we do this time. Gone? Gone? Yours is still there? Okay. Gone? Gone. Okay, everybody who had their card gone, raise your hand. Okay, well, I don't hit 100% all the time, but thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> I'll take applause. <laughs> but wait, 
on the count of three, everybody say the name of the card they just chose. One, two, three. Okay, now I'll take questions. How do you do that? It's perception. <laughs> Very well, actually. Have you any questions about it? anything to talk about? Anything else they'd like to hear about? There's one case that's been popular. I think it's the book was now called what, The Boy Who Ghosts or something. Yeah, I know of the case. I, I, the woman, the mother of the boy wrote the book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, though, so um, I don't know what to say about it. Can't comment on it. When you're trying to clear out a space and you feel that the energy is bad in that space, mm -hmm. how do you know the energy is bad and how do you do it? Well, I mean, energy, history is not necessarily good or bad, but let, let's look at it this way. If, if um, the energy is an imprint of what's gone on in that place before, Think of it as a TV program. There's good TV and there's bad TV. There's a violent TV and there's Teletubbies. <laughs> there, I mean, there's a wide range of human experience. And if what you're picking up on is a lot of anger, aggression, and fighting that happen in that spot, that's bad. If it bothers you. It's not bad if it doesn't bother you. Suppose it does. Suppose it bothers you. Yeah. Well, uh, there's several ways you can do it. There are people who can clear space. I mean, there's certainly psychics who can do that. Kathy Rudin, who used to be with the Society, had, did what she called her white tornado thing. If anybody remembers the old commercials. And we actually, we, we actually very often register high magnetic fields or higher than background magnetic fields in those spots. There's an unusual piece of the environment that's affected as well. Uh, Bill Roll and Andy Nichols have found higher than background ma geomagnetic fields in spots and with no explanation for where they're coming from at all. So we come up with a way to try to disrupt that energy. That's one way to deal with it. People can do it sometimes. We've used, uh, Pam and I have used a degausser, like those bulk tape erasers you buy at Radio Shack. You've got to keep them away from your credit cards and everything else. But they definitely change the magnetic field. And they, they work. Um, magnets themselves can do it. There, there are many different ways to play with the magnetic environment that seems to disrupt that. And of course, it will disrupt your TV and other things as well, your computer disk. You've got to keep them away from things like that. On the other hand, once people understand what it is, you know, if you live next to a freeway that they just built, that can be bad. You have two choices because you can't knock down the freeway. You can learn to live with it or you can move. You learn to live with it and think about how we hear. We start screening things out. In fact, most people living next to noisy highways screen them out. They don't even hear that noise anymore. It's selective hearing, selective attending. Until someone comes and says, how can you possibly live next to that highway? Then for the next three weeks, these people have to hear it again. <laughs> it works the same way. If, it's, if you know it's in the environment and is a neutral recording, it may be annoying, but you'll get over it in that sense. How do you do it? What do you mean, how do I do it? How do you, how do you when someone asks you to do a clear out of the space, how do you clear out the space? We usually use magnetic devices of some kind. Magnetic yeah, or if I happen to have a psychic with me, I'll use, have the psychic do it, try to do it. It's an impact, an energy impact. They're affecting the, the, magnetic, the magnetosphere in the, in the area is what we're guessing. Or they're affecting something else that has a magnetic component to it. But since the magnetic field can be disrupted, we're just figuring that something's going on with that. It's all been trial and error. Ruth. Um, I like real stories. I would like to uh, tell a small story, and we can talk about what it actually was, yeah? Okay. I was on the way to a lecture at Arthur Young's, and when I arrived, uh, I realized that I had lost um, my, all my keys on a key ring. I knew I had locked my apartment, I could barely remember, and I had it when I left my apartment. So I had lost it between my apartment and arriving at the Arthur Young lecture, and I didn't like the situation. So the only thing I knew is the key knows where they are. They know where they are. So I had to start with the keys. So during the whole lecture, I was talking to my keys, and I told them, tell the person who found you to put it on the bench where I got into the bus. So I figured maybe when I stepped into the bus or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I had lost them. The whole lecture, I was talking to my keys. I went to the bench where I had gotten into the bus. Uh, I, I hope you weren't talking out loud to your keys. Huh? No, you weren't talking out loud to your keys, right? Of course not. No, okay. yeah. 
But I was curious, was the only way to yeah. resolve the situation because the keys knew it. And um, I had taken somebody else uh, as, a, as a witness. And the first thing I knew, I uh, saw, were the keys, which were on top of the bench, where I certainly had <coughs> bench, where I had told the keys to be put. I have an explanation. Um, there are many possible explanations. Number one depends on where you drop them. I mean, let's let's take it from the non-psychic perspective yeah, first. Yeah, and that is that if they were dropped there and somebody thoughtfully put them someplace visible for somebody to find, the bench may have been the only item, only place to put them. Yeah, well, uh, at the, the, mind too, the bus driver, because the bus was uh, almost empty, uh, saw that I had dropped the keys after I had left the bus. And so he, he came back. Uh, could remember where I had gotten in the bus because we were only three passengers. That's good. And you put yeah. it at a place where I really could see it. Well, it was a nice coincidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. We can certainly read more meaning into it at that point. I really had fun talking to the Yeah. <laughs> and, and the lecturer obviously wasn't holding your attention <laughs> at that point? You know, I got, I got an email um, today. It's kind of a sad email from a woman, young woman who um, lost her fiancé in a shooting, she had in quotes, accident. Uh, didn't explain it. And she, this was a few months ago, and clearly could not let go. She was seeking advice um, and had been already talking to psychics and other people on ways to go back in time, out of body, to change or warn him, warn, you know, to change the past or warn him. Um, and wasn't, and clearly from her tone, I mean, she, she was not letting go of this idea. Um, it's perception. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, the only thing I could advise her was, fortunately, I know enough about, from science fiction, enough about theories of time, and I also have taught courses in that, that I told her that even if we had a way to do it, we wouldn't know it worked. Because unfortunately, if the timeline changed, so would our memories. And if she, if, if she went back in time and brought him back to life, we would not know that the method that she used was the reason why that happened. So it, she could hear all sorts of possibilities, and there's just no way to know. And I suggest just to see a grief counselor, you know. But uh, uh, the reality is that we don't know enough about time, whether it's even possible to change time. And again, uh, if it is possible to change time, we may not know it, because it could be happening all the time. Psychic entertainment. Okay. Heavy emphasis on the word entertainment. entertainment. Yes. Okay. Is, it, is that the part of you that you call a mentalist? I mean, yes. Okay. That is the part. Mentalism is mind reading. It is predictions. It is uh, simulation of mind over matter. Simulation, I guess, is probably the best way to put it, of psychic abilities. Kreskin. Or Mark Salem, who is a much better spokesperson for that. Subject. Who, if you don't know who he is, if you, uh, he's been on PAX TV and he'll be on a bunch of shows this this uh, coming January, I think. Sci-Fi Channel. He's actually on. Did you get the note? He's on Broadway. Oh, yes. As of November. Yeah. David Blaine does a lot of stuff that fits into this category. If anybody, if you've not seen him, next time he does a special, uh, as long as he's not frozen in a block of ice, make sure you watch it. Uh, <laughs> he well, he was standing in a block. He was standing up for 64 hours. It didn't matter whether it's cold or not. He was standing up for 64 hours without being able to move. That's human endurance, yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm, I understand that what you do is something that you've learned to do and that you're skilled at and really great at and that kind of thing. And yet you're involved in parapsychology. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have an interest in it. So my question is, in, in the process of doing the kinds of things that you do, have you ever blown your own mind? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, just now. <laughs> well, um, let me back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about why I got I started doing mentalism and magic, in fact, for that matter. When I um, was a grad student at JFK, when we had a parapsychology program, one of the courses we had to take was called Creation of Illusions. 
And this is a class in, taught by a local magician on mentalism so that we would be better prepared for fraudulent psychic coming into the laboratory. So we have an understanding of the process. And we had to learn. Now, at the same time, this is a, a group of very strange or fortuitous things that you need to know about. Number one, in college, I did stand-up comedy. Did some comedy uh, mainly on campus, but also as a DJ. So I did a lot of that stuff. So I was naturally a performer anyway. At the same time that I was taking my course at JFK, I was teaching bartending at the professional bartender school. That's how I was working my way through school at the time. Um, and a guy came in, strangely enough, the same quarter that I took this class, a guy came in who uh, was taking a refresher class, and, and he's waiting to see me. I was actually running the school, and he was making balloon animals. And so I kind of kiddingly said to him, okay, you can take the course over if you teach me how to make balloon animals. So I thought it was fun. So I learned to do that. And of course, the only place to buy those balloons was at a magic shop. So it's all kind of pulling me in to do this. Then I left the bartender school and started, started working as a bartender in Walnut Creek and in Concord, and I started doing magic behind the bar. It was fun. It's fun. So um, I pursued that, and when I got out of grad school, I uh, went back to New York. I joined a local magicians group back there, had a bunch of really great guys, including a couple of mentalists. And I performed. I mean, we did a lot of shows. I performed at comedy clubs, doing comedy magic for a while. I used to perform at Foo Bars when, when it was in Martinez and Pleasant Hill for a while. Uh, and so it just was something that is part of my persona. It's a way of, of a kind of expressing myself artistically, if you want to call it that. Um, and at the same time, more and more I've gotten into it, the better and better prepared I've been to deal with the skeptics and fraudulent psychics. And when I talk about the fraudulent psychics, I'm talking about the guys who are out to take your money, big time, who are out to take the researchers. That's, those are the people I'm talking I'm not talking about the people on Telegraph. I don't care about them. <laughs> you know, you pay 10 bucks for tarot reading. If they're good, you, it's worth 10 bucks. If they're not good, it's not worth 10 bucks. It's, it's as simple as that. It doesn't matter if they're psychic, they're reading tarot cards, that's truth in advertising. Somebody read your palm is palm reading. That is truth in advertising. Nothing untrue about that. Um, so it's, it's a matter of kind of bringing the two things together. And um, somehow I ended up, <laughs> uh, it was suggested to me to join the Psychic Entertainers Association a few years ago, which I wasn't ready for for a number of years because I've been focusing more and more on mentalism. Uh, I've done seance shows. My show is called Seance Fiction Theater. And uh, I've done them at the, Mo in fact, I'll be doing them again, it looks like, at the Moss Beach Distillery very soon, uh, as soon as we get everything going with the Ritz-Carlton. And um, it's just is something that has kind of brought me a different kind of capacity in parapsychology. Um, it's actually freaked out a lot of the skeptics. It's freaked out a lot of the true believers as well. I get accused of being, you know, uh, a traitor on both sides. So which is good. I don't mind doing that. But, you know, I like to think of myself as the anti-Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Ted Karmolovich. <laughs> there are many different <coughs> phenomena. For, for example, automatic writing and uh, all the novels that have been written. Uh, well, there's many phenomena. And you know, the strange thing, here's, here's an interesting point. Um, it's, not it's not just perception. And getting back to magic also, magicians also have psychic experiences. Uh, Randy's been actually an exception to the rule. We had a panel back in 1983 at the Parapsychological Association Convention with a number of the guys who were the founding members of the, of the Psychic Entertainers Association, all of whom had had psychic experiences of one kind or another, and basically talked down Randy. Um, I've met a lot of the guys who have, in the middle of their acts, gotten something. And they say it because it's OK to be wrong. It's ESP. If you're a magician, everything's going to work. If you're a mentalist, it doesn't. So, and. 99 out of 100 times, when those things pop into their head, it's odd things like somebody's social security number, somebody's driver's license number, something about somebody in the audience, and they're right. And of course, it looks like it's all part of the act, but they haven't a clue as to how they got it. They're in the mindset. Works. And recently, um, I found out that one of the skeptics who has a $20,000 prize refused to test uh, one of the psychic entertainers, offer, uh, wanted to take the test. Like it was one of, and the guy said, no, you're a mentalist. He said, but I can do it psychically. Doesn't matter. I won't test you. So, you know, there's a double standard here, too. Mm -hmm. I'm working for the psychic, um, as a spiritual emergency network, mm -hmm. and you get quite a few cases. And I think uh, sometimes you have to take care of the people who have these experiences. For example, if you have a precognitive uh, dream, of two people dying there quite alive still. 
you have to take care of these people and prepare them. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot that, that can be done. The one thing about precognition that, that seems to be right, and if you want to talk about changing time, is that it's a, it seems to be a perception of probable future, not definite future. So, um, well, I think you know when it's definite. When you, I have a measurement. Yeah, I mean, but no there. No doubt at yeah. all, I believe it. Yeah. And seldom I have no doubt at all, you know, so I don't. Well, you can believe it's definite and still change it. I change a lot because I have lots of doubt myself. Yeah. It's definite if you don't do anything. Yeah. yeah it's, it's literally creating your own reality, changing time, but it's changing the future time. Or depending on a physicist you talk to, it could be changing no time because there is no time. <laughs> and we're almost out of time, so I'll take one more question. <laughs> or not. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I uh, hope you had an enjoyable time. <laughs>